Well, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, what Malachi is addressing in the passage that we read together is trouble at home. Trouble at home, and particularly with regard to the marriages of the people. And when you think about that, and when you read it in the context of Malachi's whole prophecy, and we didn't read beyond our text But earlier verses tell us about how the people were struggling in relationship to the Lord. For example, they were doubting his love. And at the same time, they were careless with regard to worship. They were not living in sweet communion with the Lord. And how often when that's so, when there's trouble with the Lord, how often correspondingly there's trouble at home? If things aren't well with God, how can they be well anywhere else? One of my commentaries on Malachi is from Dr. Barrett at a seminary. And he says about this, I quote him, he says, Loose worship and loose social morality always go together. If you're not good in worship, you're not going to be good at home. Of course, it works both ways, doesn't it? When, when you're not good at home, when you're sinning with abandon at home, then it's not going to go well in worship. It's kind of a downward spiral. And whenever we're stuck in it, we need to be stopped by the Lord. And this prophecy is aiming to do just that. Yes, in Malachi's day, for sure, but can we not say also in our day we face the same danger and we need the same intervention. We, we need the prophets. We need their words. Now, having said that, the obvious focus in the chapter or in the text today is, is marriage. And whenever that's the subject, it can bring to the service all sorts of reactions, because all of us find ourselves in different situations. For example, many here are married, and thankfully, happily so. Blessedly so. And when that's your experience, what reason to be humbled and thankful to the Lord? That's not to say there are no challenges. Every married couple, no matter how wonderful it might be, everyone has to work at it. But then there may be those here whose marriage is difficult for different reasons. There may be those here who have suffered a lot in marriage. And there may be those who are no longer married and who mourn that. And there may be those who long to be married and mourn that they are not. And others are maybe fine with single life. And perhaps some are divorced and or remarried. And so the point is when we hear Malachi or anyone on the subject of marriage anything, any text, it's, it's important to remember that we're not all in the same situation. And so we need to be sensitive and thoughtful. And at the same time, if we think about how marriage has been created by God, given to man already in the garden, before the fall and preserved after the fall, and how foundational it is, is to society at large and also and especially in the church, how important that we're clear as to what God requires and to make sure that we not only believe what he says, but also uphold it at every point. Especially now the point of our text, which is all about this, Malachi pleading for godly, faithful marriages. Malachi pleading for godly, faithful marriages. That's that's the text. That's the message. And it is as needed today as it was in Malachi's day. Malachi pleading for godly, faithful marriages. So with that theme before us and with the help of God, let's listen to these these verses. And we can do so in terms of three key points. And the first one is this, no more treachery. No more treachery. Now treachery simply means unfaithfulness. When someone is treacherous or behaves treacherously, then what happens is they are unfaithful, and in this case to the Lord and to their spouse. And this is what Malachi is so concerned about and so zealous to correct and prevent. In fact, five times in the text, 
In the short passage that we read five times, Malachi calls out treachery. Verse 10, why do we deal treacherously? Verse 11, Judah has dealt treacherously. Verse 14, you have dealt treacherously. 15, let none deal treacherously. And 16, do not deal treacherously. So we can't miss the point, can we? No more treachery. So what exactly was happening? Let's follow the argument. Starting in verse 10, Malachi begins with two questions, two rhetorical questions. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? And the answer to both questions, of course, is yes, yes. We have one father. One God has created us. And so with these questions, Malachi establishes the point that God's people aren't just anyone living in this world, but we are indeed God's people, bound to him and and blessed by him and ever accountable to him. We really do live before him, before the face of the living God. And so everything has meaning and consequence in relationship to him. And so having established that, Malachi then highlights the first offense of the people. We are dealing treacherously with one another, he says. We are profaning the covenant of the fathers. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel. And Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. And he's going on and on, and by this point, we might be wondering, well, Malachi, what have they done? And Malachi tells us, Judah has married the daughter of a foreign god. And what that means, what Malachi means here, when we work that through, He's talking about how the people of the day, and the young men particularly, were marrying pagan girls. The young Israelite men were taking for themselves wives from the surrounding idolatrous nations. They were going to their idol-worshipping neighbors to find themselves marriage partners. Now, why were they doing that? The text doesn't say. At first, we might say it was because the men liked the women. And obviously, that could have been and likely was a factor. Usually, we marry people we find attractive and desirable. All of that. But commentators also wonder about other motives. For example, how many young men may have been tempted to marry pagan women for their political connections and for their financial security and prosperity? In other words, power and money. And this could well have been been the case. After all, the pagans had been around for a long time. They were well settled in the land. Meanwhile, the Jews, Malachi is prophesying after the exile and after the return from exile. So the Jews had been gone for several generations. They had come back and were trying to get reestablished in the land and had to rebuild basically from nothing. And so were likely disadvantaged politically and socially and economically. So what better way for a young man to get ahead in life? What better way than to marry up, as we sometimes say? And if it means marrying a pagan, well then, so be it. And so they were engaging in these mixed marriages, and for Malachi it was a problem, and it was even dangerous, not because of mixed ethnicities, but because of mixed faiths, mixed religions, mixed worship. So Malachi is describing this pattern as dealing treacherously because it was a kind of unfaithfulness to God and to the people. It was a departure from pure devotion to the Lord It was even, Malachi says, an abomination. Now he's very strong. We might wonder if he's warranted in being so strong. Is that necessary, Malachi? Is it such a problem? But what we have to understand is that the result was a corruption of worship. Because idolatry was being mixed together with the Lord and somehow idols were being set alongside the living God and were were being... And the idolatrous practices that were associated with them were were being observed alongside the worship of the Lord. And the result was dishonoring to God. It was a breaking of the first and second commandments. And it was a confusing and a corrupting of the people. And just for a moment, let's be very transparent about something. If you're a believer and you marry an unbeliever, that doesn't necessarily mean you will become an idolater. Hear me carefully. If you are a believer and you marry an unbeliever, that does not necessarily mean you will become an idolater. By the grace of God, you may still be faithful to the Lord. 
And we may thank him when that's so. And some of you may be in that very situation. I, I don't know. And yet at the same time, is it not fair to say that it, it, it will not be easy if you as a believer are married to an unbeliever? It will not be easy because how can two walk together except they be agreed? As Amos, another prophet says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? A mixed faith marriage won't be easy. And what is also true is a mixed faith marriage will no doubt bring more temptations to depart from the faith. It's simply a matter of fact. If you as a believer marry an unbeliever, you will encounter more temptations and likely greater temptations to depart from the faith. And let all our young people remember this also when you begin to think about marriage. The words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, they are not about marriage per se, but they apply nonetheless. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Should this not be enough, young people, to compel you to resolve before the Lord? You will not, you will never marry an unbeliever. And before you become serious with someone, you will make sure that you yourself are in the faith. And whoever you seek to make your spouse, you will make sure is in the faith. Too many people in Malachi's day, too too many people were saying, it doesn't matter, who cares? And Malachi was coming after them and saying, don't you understand, it's treachery against the Lord and his people. Oh, let there be no more treachery. But then there was another problem. A second thing, as the prophet says in verse 13. And what seems to be happening was this. Many of the men who were seeking pagan wives, they were already married. They were married to one of their own. They each had an Israelite wife, many of them a God-fearing woman, at least in name. But now these women wanted, or these men wanted, pagan wives. And to get them, they first had to put away their Israelite wives. And so they dealt treacherously with them, and they divorced them. Either that means they made them second-class wives, or a second sort of wife, or a servant in the home. Or maybe they sent them out of the door altogether. Out you go, no longer a wife. And just thinking of that, how cruel, of course. But notice how Malachi reinforces his point by a number of appeals, as if to say, how can you do such a thing? Because verse 14, she is the wife of your youth. So she is the one you married when you were both young. And so Malachi says, she is your companion, and she is your wife by covenant. And verse 15, she is the one with whom God has made you one. Now verse 15 is difficult to translate and difficult to know exactly what's being said, but what it seems to be is an allusion to Genesis 2, 24, all about how a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two, you remember, shall be called one flesh. And that's not simply about their intimacy. It's about more than that. It's about how the Lord mysteriously knits them together into a unit. They are two people, yes, but now they are one flesh bound together, belonging to each other. And and together they share even one spirit. And together they each and together have the Holy Spirit. And together they are called, if God gives them children, together they are called to raise up their children for the Lord and for his glory. Godly seed, as Malachi says. By the way, and it's just a by the way for a moment, what a goal for all parents to pursue. Godly seed. And let it influence everything you do. As parents. And likewise, what a goal for all children and young people. Likewise, to pursue, to be godly, to fear the Lord, to trust the Lord, to live for the Lord. Don't ever think you're too cool for that. Or you can wait with that. The God of the covenant calls you today. But now the point is, husbands, 
in view of all that Malachi highlights, in view of it all, will you really leave your wife? Will you really send her away? Will you really demote her and divorce her? Malachi is saying, how can you ever do that? It's treachery. God gave you your wife to lead and to love and together to be a blessing to each other. Think of the years you've shared and think of the lives you've, you've built together and think of the children you've raised over time and will you really walk away from all of that? Simply because you want, say, another woman, a newer one, a younger one, a richer one? What treachery. That's what it is. What treachery towards your wife, towards the Lord, towards your community. How can you? Don't do it. Do you hear how Malachi pleads? He pleads with the people. Let us have godly homes. Let us be faithful in our marriages. That was the message then. Is it not needed today as well? Anyone ever tempted to deal treacherously with your spouse? Whether your wife or your husband, it can work that way too. Anyone ever tempted? Anyone ever done it? Maybe started down the path? For example, what if emotionally you check out of your marriage? You still live in the same home. You still sleep in the same bed. You're present, but you're not really present. And not because life's busy and, or hard or something else. Th those things can happen. And, and, of course, we need to be aware of that and addressing that. But what if you check out of your marriage emotionally because your eyes are wandering or your heart is wandering? How many people deal treacherously, treacherously with their spouse when they consume pornography? We should never do that. I know it's an epidemic in our culture. I know many men are easily tripped, and even women. But we should never do it. It is wrong. It's a form of treachery. How many people deal treacherously when they form intimate friendships with people not their spouse? Husbands with other women, wives with other men. Even if it's only an emotional relationship, is it not a form of treachery? And many times emotional relationships do not remain emotional. That's simply how it works. How many deal treacherously when they literally leave their current spouse for another? And some keep it on the side in secret and others forget the secrecy, and they simply leave and never come back. Malachi names it all for what it is, treachery. And it was happening in Malachi's day, and sadly it has happened ever since. But let there be no more of it on the part of the confessing people of God. That's the point Malachi is making, pleading Pleading for godly, faithful marriages. Let there be no more treachery. Also, also because, and here we go to the second point, notice that God is watching. God is watching. Well, of course he is. That's obvious. But Malachi makes a point of it, especially in verse 14, when he says, the Lord has been witness. Now, in the context, the people have just said, why doesn't the Lord accept our worship? It's at this point that we hear them dispute. And by the way, that's a key word in, a key idea in Malachi's prophecy. The whole prophecy, in fact, is organized around six disputes. The Lord says something and the people dispute. And the Lord engages that. And, and so here, what the people are disputing, what, what they can't understand is why the Lord would be so indifferent and even resistant to their sacrifices. We're worshiping and he doesn't notice. For what reason, they say? And the answer is because the Lord has been witness. And it is that witnessing that we need to think about. What it means is that he has been watching. And again, he sees everything. He sees everything. But also when we worship at church, he sees us. And when we go home, he sees us. God 
is watching. And that means two things at least. One is that he won't accept hypocrisy. God will not, God will never accept hypocrisy. Or to say that another way, you, you cannot be good at church and be bad at home. You cannot be good at church while being bad at home and expect his blessing. It's not possible. He will not accept hypocrisy. And he'll know if you're doing it. He'll know if you're being bad at home, but meanwhile here, on, here, here at worship, you're, you're putting on a different front. No, no one else may know. No one else may pick up on it, but the Lord always knows. He knew it in Malachi's day. That's why Malachi says what he says. Verse 13, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So these people, they were making a real show of their religiosity. Look how sincere we are, how earnest we are. Do you not see our tears, Lord? We're crying to show you how desperately we see our need and seek your grace. It's not wrong to cry. I mean, walking with God involves emotions. The Bible speaks about a broken and a contrite heart. That's not a bad thing, but what is a bad thing is, and what is totally acceptable is when the tears aren't true. If we're pretending to be good, pretending to be serious, pretending to be earnest, but we don't mean it. In reality, we're wicked, as wicked as can be. And if that's ever us, then we can be sure that while no one else may know, the Lord knows. He's always known. He'll always know. That's why Malachi says, verse 13, he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. You may bring it to him thinking you are reflecting sincerity when in reality you are not, and he won't accept it. It means nothing to him. And the takeaway then is that he's watching. Let that sober us into sincerity, including in worship, including in all of life, also our home life. Because notice the second thing we learn from God watching. What Malachi makes clear is that God will curse unfaithfulness. So he won't accept hypocrisy and he will curse unfaithfulness. Back in verse 12, for example, Malachi prays for God's Malachi prays for God's judgment, and in the severest of terms, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this. So whoever is dealing treacherously, whether it be through marrying a pagan wife and or divorcing one's current wife, verse 12 includes an interesting line uh, all about whoever is awake and aware. That's a bit unclear. It's because the Hebrew is obscure, and so translations go different ways. When you read the King James, for example, it translates that phrase as the master and the scholar, as if to say, whomever might be in view. The ESV translates it as any descendant of Jacob. Again, as if to say, whoever might be sinning in this way, let them be cut off. Our translation, awake and aware, suggests anyone who is sinning consciously, knowingly. It's probably impossible to solve the translation issue, and yet the main point is clear. All those who are dealing treacherously, the Lord, may he cut them off, which means really may he put them to death, which is in essence ultimate excommunication. Not simply the church doing it, God doing it. May the Lord cut off. That's what Malachi prays for, and it's a revelation of God's own mind and heart. This is what he will do to every unrepentant traitor. He won't bless unfaithfulness. He cannot bless unfaithfulness. Notice, too, how verse 16 says that he hates divorce. God hates divorce. Now, here, too, there are translation challenges. It's because the Hebrew is difficult. And, and so there are some, including the English Standard Version, that translates like this. For the one who does not love his wife but divorces her, so that's a bit different. The hate in our text is what the man does in not loving his wife. What the man does and not what God does. So in the English Standard Version, it doesn't say God hates divorce. And, and why some, if not many, prefer this translation is because the phrase, that was, as we have it in our translation, God hates divorce, you know, sometimes that gets misused gets misused by abusive men and their supporters 
it gets misused to compel suffering women to stay in their abusive, to stay with their abusive and adulterous husbands. Because after all, God hates divorce. Maybe you've heard that too, and maybe you've even believed that. And so this little phrase, as in our translation, has become a hammer in the hands of some to, to beat suffering women into submission. And because of that, a translation like the ESV has is maybe more attractive. It, it takes that hammer away. Now, in response to that whole debate and discussion, three things very quickly. Number one, we should never beat suffering wives or husbands, for that matter. That can happen too, though less common. But we should never, ever beat anyone with little snippets of God's word. If a spouse is suffering in an abusive marriage, they do not need us to say to them, God hates divorce, so stay home and submit and make it work. Not that every abuse situation means you need to leave. Maybe. But pastoral care needs to be a lot more thoughtful, a lot more careful. Secondly, having said that, even if our text is better translated, say, for example, by the ESV than as we have it, even so, even if God hates divorce is not the right translation, maybe we'll never solve that debate, but it's still true that God hates divorce. So we shouldn't let translation debates weaken our belief on that point. We don't beat suffering people with the phrase, but we don't weaken our commitment to the reality that God hates divorce. Now, not that it may never happen. Sometimes it may happen. If there has been adultery or abandonment, Sometimes divorce may happen. Sometimes divorce needs to happen. But even so, even then it is grievous and never something to cheer about. It is not what God intended. From the beginning, Jesus said, it was not so. It was not part of his good creation. God hates divorce. He does. And thirdly, still on this point, regardless of the translation issues, what's crystal clear in this text is that God has been watching all the goings-on in the homes of his people. And he has seen the way husbands, some anyways, were mistreating their wives. Verse 16 suggests even with violence. No doubt rough words. Maybe even rough behavior. Rough handling. It was terrible. And the Lord is upset and he refuses to bless his people for it. And instead, we have every reason to believe a curse was coming down upon them. And so it will today, too, if we live unfaithfully in our homes, in our marriages, in our families. The moment you start to deal treacherously, the moment you start down that path is the moment you begin to lose God's blessing and you come under his curse. That's a fact. No matter how safe you might think you are, no matter how right everything seems to be going in your eyes, if you are living as a traitor in your own home, you've got no blessing to count on. Only God's curse. Over in the New Testament, Peter says it like this, God won't hear your prayers. Think of that. If you won't care for your wife, respect your wife, dwell with your wife with understanding, if you won't do that, God won't hear you pray. And he'll know because he's watching, because he's witness. That's the point, remember? And so we go to our last major point in the sermon. Take heed. Take heed. Now that's straight from the text, isn't it? Twice, in fact. End of verse, end of verse 15 and end of verse 16. Take heed, says Malachi, especially to your spirit. Take heed to your spirit. So what does that mean? Well, it means that unfaithfulness begins in our spirit, in our heart. That, that's where the seeds of all these things are, are, are born. That's where the seeds of all these things are found, where they are planted, where they are watered, where they are nurtured in our hearts, in our spirits. If we are not careful there, if we don't put to death there the things that God hates, if we don't deal with the inside of us, the outside of us will someday expose the inside. So if we're going to have godly, faithful marriages, we need to guard our spirits, guard our hearts. We need to keep them with all diligence. Take heed to your spirit. 
That means don't let unfaithful thoughts have any freedom or any life. If they come, when they come, and be sure they will come because they come for everyone to some degree. No one can make it through life without a struggle at this point. Even in the healthiest, happiest marriage, the devil being what he is, the world being what it is, our own hearts being what they are, all of us need to be so careful. And whenever there is any hint of treachery appearing, arising, squash it, stomp on it. If you don't, the thing will grow and it will be harder and harder to get rid of. It will be like a wild weed that soon enough takes over the whole plant of your life. Take heed of every danger. And take heed also to cultivate love and patience and faithfulness. If evil starts in our hearts, that's also where good needs to begin. And so pray for that. Lord, let me have a clean heart. Let me have a pure heart. And work at that to replace sinfulness with faithfulness. Let that be something you think about and pursue. And how important also that we're so careful with what we read and listen to and watch. Especially in the world in which we live, isn't it so Many a book written today, and you can borrow it, you can buy it, and when you read it, it doesn't help you take heed. It feeds your mind and heart with all kinds of treachery. Doesn't the same go for all the music we might listen to? Whether it be over your earbuds or in your cars or wherever, is what you are listening to helping you take heed to your spirit? Or is it making you restless? Is it stirring up in you unholy desires? Maybe if you're not married for something you may not yet enjoy. Or if you are married for pleasures with someone not your spouse. Same with all the sorts of things we might watch. How careful we need to be with all that comes from the world. The world doesn't care about faithfulness. Not the way God cares about faithfulness. And so we can't be too careful with all that we experience, all that we receive, all the media that comes in. The internet, with our phones, our computers, it's so easy to sin in secret and you might get away with it for a while. It's easy, but it's potentially fatal. Don't let yourself do it. Don't let yourself do it. And if you're doing it, tell someone today because you want to break from it. Take heed to your spirit. Young people, are you taking heed to your spirit? Young adults, Older people. It starts with this. It really does. Guarding your heart. Dealing with your heart. And then your ears and your eyes and everything else. Does anyone here need, especially to hear this message today? Because perhaps this very day you've been contemplating unfaithfulness. Or maybe you're halfway committed to it already. Or maybe you're fully into it even for a long time. Don't do it anymore. You need to stop where you are. You need to turn back. You need to depart from treachery. You need to renounce it. You need to remember God is watching and God is saying to you, take heed. And go after godliness and faithfulness, also and especially in marriage. Let it be something we do, congregation. Let it be something we commit to from our earliest days and all our days. And let us help each other. Let us be a community that we may thank God when we also have that heritage, but keep preserving it day by day and year by year and generation after generation. We will encourage each other in the way of faithfulness. How much it matters. Yes, let us pray and work for godly, faithful marriages and let us do so with our eyes on Jesus. Let's finish with that thought, with our eyes on Jesus. Now maybe you say, where, where is Jesus in this passage? We don't see his name and we don't see his work. That's true. But can we not say that he, more than anyone else, he is the godly offspring to which Malachi refers, the godly seed. Think about that. Why did Malachi care so much about the faithfulness of the people? Why does the Lord care in Malachi's day about the marriages of the people? It's because he seeks godly offspring. Of course, that means in a general way that generation after generation fears and loves God. But in Malachi's day, the Lord was also working toward the day when he might bring his son into this world. 
And through the years, the Lord was seeking to preserve his people in an ungodly generation. In, an, in, in, a, in a world given over to unfaithfulness, the Lord was seeking to preserve a nucleus of faithful people so that in the fullness of time, he might bring forth the Holy One, as Gabriel described him to Mary, the Holy One who will be called the Son of God. And he is born. And how wonderful is that? Because he comes finally, and despite all the unfaithfulness even of his own people, Still he comes, and he comes because God is gracious, and he comes to be a godly man, and so he was. And then he was cut off. He was cut off from the tents of Jacob. Though he had done no sin, never was there iniquity in his mouth, never was there unfaithfulness in his heart. I always do those things that please my father. He could say, Yes, and yet he was cursed. He was cut off from his people. He was cut off out of the land of the living. What Malachi prayed for about the unfaithful of his day happened instead to Jesus. The godliest seed of all was crucified to the cross. And it was for the sin of his people. It was for the unfaithfulness of sinners like you and me. We deserve to be cut off. He was in our place. And now the gospel is that we may be forgiven. Incredible. Maybe you think of your life, you think of your past, you think of things you've done. You may be forgiven. And as many as turn to Jesus, everything we have done may be forgiven. How amazing that is, that he forgives it all, the Lord. And we may be renewed and we may be enabled to live new and godly lives, and we may be helped and strengthened by the Lord to be faithful through Jesus and by his Spirit. And so whatever our situation may be today, in the words of Hebrews 12, we're to run the race before us with endurance, looking unto Jesus. For as you look to him and trust in him, he will help you with everything. And we need him more than anything else. And we need him more than anyone else. For remember the point with which we began. Looseness in relationship to God will result in looseness in everything else. If we're not right with him, we'll not be right anywhere else. How crucial it is to believe in Christ, to become right with God, and to be enabled to live anew and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How crucial. Because then you can face all the challenges of life, including in marriage, whether easy or not, or maybe longing for marriage. Or whatever your lot or your history or your pain, you can't do it without Jesus. You can't make it without Jesus. So look to him and trust always in him. Amen. Let us sing together from Psalter number 89. 89, all the stanzas.